other words, in the first 15 or 20 years after World War II, there were more scientific and technological breakthroughs than in all the years before in man's history. Dr. Oppenheimer described our time as belonging to science. And then he said something I shall never forget. Speaking of his friend, Niels Bohr, the Danish physicist, he quoted him as saying that Niels Bohr said, I never get an idea without wanting to commit suicide at the same time. The implication, of course, being concern for what governments, industry, and people would do with further revelations of nature. No wonder this unease and distress and apprehensive fear around the world today. People don't know what is coming next. There was only one way, I think, in the United States that we might have entered this new age differently, and that is if presidents had talked to us all at the same time, because only a president can have the ear of all the people and the attention of all the national press on critical, important issues. And no president successfully succeeded in doing that. The arms race began shortly after the Soviet Union tested their first atomic bomb. And then when we tested our hydrogen bomb, then they tested their hydrogen bombs. When we made multiple war-headed rockets, then shortly after they made multiple war-headed rockets. Now we both have nuclear submarines prowling the sea carrying lethal loads. We and the Russians have stockpiled between us the equivalent of 10 to 15 tons of TNT for every man, woman, and child on Earth. But that doesn't seem to be enough. The United States adds three hydrogen bombs daily to this stockpile. And the Soviet Union undoubtedly is doing the same thing. Each of these new bombs has a destructive force equal to 100 times that of the Hiroshima bomb. Each one is capable of wiping out a city the size of New York and taking all the people with it. For the last quarter of a century, there's been a greater and greater reliance on arms as the deterrent to a nuclear third world war. And fear, ignorant fear, has supported this race. At the end of World War I, before the Hiroshima bomb, Albert Einstein warned, and he served at head of one of the committees in the League of Nations. He warned that if man didn't put an end to arms, arms would put an end to man. And when the arms race heated up in the mid-50s, Einstein again warned, the unleashed power of the atom has changed everything save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift to unparalleled catastrophe. In 1945, Eugene Rabinovich, distinguished physicist and humanist, thought of as the conscience of science by many of his peers, co-founded with Albert Einstein, the Bulletin of Atomic Science, to help us, to help us understand this new age and to meet it reasonably and knowingly. To tell us what we dare do in this new age with this new power and what we dare not do. Too few have read the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences. It's published in Chicago. And gradually the word disarmament has been replaced by the words arms control with all that that implies. You can't control them. We have evidence of that. And the SALT agreements have resulted in the development only of new generations of nuclear weapons and new generations of delivery systems. Abel Myrdal, the former Swedish representative to the United Nations on disarmament talks at Geneva, and at the United Nations has described SALT agreements as non-armament agreements or mere cosmetic devices used to stall for time and to make people believe that something has been achieved. James Fulbright, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, just before he left the Congress, after his defeat, had this to say in a long, uh, after a long distinguished career. And I think this statement of his is quite as important as that of Eisenhower's, President Dwight Eisenhower's 
on warning us against the military industrial complex. In an article appearing in the Progressive Magazine, uh, Fulbright said, in an article titled Arms Without End, one of the questions of Fulbright, which we have asked ourselves as a country, is what in the name of God is strategic superiority? What is the significance of it, politically, militarily, operationally, at these levels, at these numbers? What do you do with it? We must stop, said he, upping the ante by pursuing programs which tend to move us away from agreement rather than toward it. There are those who are not readily interested in bringing the arms race to a close. Indeed, our own military is the principal obstacle in the path toward strategic arms limitation agreements with the Soviet Union. We have an obligation, said Fulbright, to be attentive to the military concerns, but we must not fail, fall into the trap of avoiding out of narrow fears the kind of agreement which will save us. I do not wish to imply that I believe dealing with the Russians is an easy task, said Fulbright. Obviously, they can take a hard line with us just as we can with them. However, our side must be able to approach the Soviet Union with soundly based comprehensive proposals which represent the considered consensus of American leadership. We cannot afford to continue in a situation in which we cannot achieve agreement with the Soviet Union because we cannot agree even among ourselves as to what we ought to do or what we ought to seek." End quote. The dragged out nuclear arms race has had very serious psychological effects on us. A gradual acceptance of the possibility of a nuclear war has bred a growing contempt for human life, a growing indifference to the survival of others if only we are safe. We, the people who support and endure this arms race in the mythical belief that it will save us, become desensitized, indifferent to suffering, at first to those abroad and then inescapably to our neighbors at home. And now worse, in the 1970s, our thinking is being changed in a most subtle and dangerous way. In the Bolton of Atomic Scientists editorial, September 1974, Samuel H. Day wrote, with the passage of time, there is a growing tendency to conventionalize the concept of resort to nuclear arms in contingency plans for war, both in the United States and in the Soviet Union, as well as in other powers who have achieved nuclear weapons capability. The narcoticizing of policymakers and the public itself to the implication of nuclear armament is a source of growing peril to the world. And the 1975 December issue, Day again returned to this issue. And he said, one new aspect is a tendency to incorporate the use of nuclear weapons into doctrines and contingency plans for conventional warfare. This development now finds expression in the United States policy of counterforce, which envisions the use of US nuclear weapons in response to attack or threat of attack by conventional arms. The prospect that the United States, said he, would actually use its atomic firepower in a military exigency is given credence by the deployment of thousands of US tactical nuclear weapons in potential war zones such as Western Europe and Southern Korea. Thus, the distinction between conventional war and nuclear war becomes steadily, steadily more blurred. Year by year, nuclear war becomes more thinkable, more doable. Now, three little vignettes to end this. 
In June 1975, Ford, President Ford, refused to disavow the first use of nuclear weapons. Secretary Schlesinger reaffirmed the President's stand a few days later when he said, under no circumstances should we disavow the first use of nuclear weapons. The Secretary had previously told the Senate subcommittee how he thought a nuclear war could be contained. Contained is the operative word you want to remember. Now listen to this carefully. If, said he, we were to maintain continued communications with the Soviet Union during the war, and if we were to describe precisely and meticulously the limited nature of our actions, including the desire to avoid attacking their urban industrial base, in spite of whatever one says, of his, says historically in advance that everything must go all out, meaning everybody use all the weapons they have, political leaders on both sides will be under powerful pressure to continue to be sensible. <laughs> That's unbelievable. You know, why can't we be sensible before this Holocaust takes place? Just unbelievable. It's mad. Now, just the other day, our new Secretary of Defense said, I'm talking, you know, about who, uh, said we do not preclude even first use of nuclear weapons in defense of our interests. Not in our defense, but in defense of our interests. That's pretty broad. The arms race has institutionalized, was institutionalized at Geneva and Vladivostok because neither the United States nor the Soviet Union psychologically were able to give up doomsday weapons. The arms race has infected other nations, large and small, with armitis. There are now six nuclear powers. It looks as though very shortly there will be more. In addition to the spread of nuclear weapons, there is now the spread of non-nuclear weapons by industrial nations vying with one another to see who can sell and export the most. The United, it's estimated in this fiscal year the United States will sell $11 billion in non-nuclear weapons around the world. The acceleration of the arms race has increased security coverage and will continue to increase security coverage. Despite all the disclosures, Watergate investigations, those of Senator Frank Church and Representative Otis, Otis Pike of the intelligence agencies have brought to light how much has been kept from us, how much we need to know to grasp an understanding of where the race is taking us. Compassion for the young men who could not or would not take part in that tragically mistaken war. Do I believe in unconditional amnesty? I do. I think we ought to bring our young men home. In this... In this bicentennial year, let us remember that we have enjoyed the respect of other people because of our belief in the equality and dignity of, li of human beings in a regard for life. We must rededicate ourselves to the ideals and principles of the founders. Ideas are powerful in the evolution of the human family. The example we set here at home is vital to democracy at home and anywhere else in the world. As you young people go through life, you will have to make at times decisive decisions under strain which will affect your future and your character. One usually reacts in accordance with established patterns of thinking. If one has been guided by purely personal considerations with disregard for others, for what is fair and right, a choice will not be made objectively. If on the other hand, one has sought objective appraisal through daily practice, then under duress, the question of choice is narrowed. One is free to come to a reasoned decision. Finding answers to difficult questions is often perplexing enough, even when all is the, only was the desire to choose on the basis of what is reasonable, of what is right, of what is just. Habits can be constructive or destructive. 
one must guard against those that cripple. Success, more often than not, depends on the fulfillment of one's own potential rather than on competition with another. And that's true of people, and that's true of a nation. If one is trustworthy, if one's word is one's bond, he or she will have stature. It is so with a nation. Character isn't inherited. One builds it daily by the way one thinks and acts, thought by thought, action by action. If one lets fear, hate, or anger take possession of the mind, they become self-forged chains. The challenge to all of us is to stay alive in our time in life, to stay alive while we live, not to be dead before we're dead, to remain open, receiving, responding to nature, friends, the passerby, to learn the art of love, of giving oneself freely without the demand of a quid pro quo. Thank you. Mrs. Douglas, thank you. I shouldn't say it, I talk too much. Toward the end of the first book of Plato's Republic, they ask Socrates, okay, so how do you define justice? And he says it is no small matter we discuss, but rather how a person should live. And she has lived it. We thank you. Mrs. Douglas, we have discovered is just as good in the give and take of an informal discussion and questions and answers, unlike a formal, former political opponent of hers. <laughs> and she has agreed to take questions, and while she gets her breath, I will feel the first one and repeat it, and then she will carry it from there. Over here. I think you heard it, Mrs. Douglas, and everybody in the room. <laughs> Did he deserve the name? Was he a crook? Uh, <coughs> well, he brought that subject up. I say he brought that subject up. Uh, uh, and he said he wasn't. here. Why is so little being said about Senate Bill 1? Well, the Civil Liberties papers are carrying it. Uh, do you read the Progressive? The Progressive magazine was published in Wisconsin, which was formed by La Follette. Uh, that that paper's carrying it. A Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, I don't know if they're carrying it, I don't think they're carrying it. But uh, New York Times is carrying it. Article after article, I'm sure your Des Moines paper is carrying it. Uh, uh, there's really considerable coverage of, of S1. I don't think that's one of the buried issues, I really don't. Uh, organizations are, are concerned about it. 
uh, uh, law organizations throughout the country. You want to take these questions? Are you all tired? Do you want to just go home? Or do you want to ask any questions? <laughs> We don't know that he'd be the candidate yet. I'm listening to him very carefully. I haven't marked him off as, as, as someone I can't support. But my, 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 my uh, favorite choice is Frank Church. And he will be entering the, the uh, Nebraska primary. He's talking around the country. His wife is talking. Organizations are being formed for him around the country. And he will be very active from now on. He's talking, as I said. Uh, the country would be very active, and I'm not as sure that it's, that it's all over at all. I think uh, that uh, Mr. Carter has made an extraordinary race, but, uh, uh, but uh, he has a long way to go. Yes. I really don't know. Can you take that? I really don't know. Well, uh, I won't attempt to answer the question. Uh, <laughs> uh, the question is asked of Mrs. Douglas. You uh, uh, probably the, the best you can do up here are the alternative arguments each way. There is no need for a special prosecutor, it is argued on the other side, if you have an honest president and attorney general. <laughs> I, I really think it gets back to us, you know. That holds true all the way through. We could, we could, there are certain rules that have to be changed, certain regulations have to be changed, but it gets back to us. And unless we're very careful, now you've done very well here, you, you've, got, you've got two excellent senators. Clark is, is, is stunning in the Senate. He's just splendid. <laughs> and the others, the younger senator will also, I'm sure, have a very distinguished career. It looks as though he would. And you've done that in Iowa. And I think in each community, we just have to be more careful, more informed, and be more sure of the people we entrust with the right to vote for us. I know no other way. I don't think you can build enough protections uh, uh, in addition to those we have uh, to guard against malfeasance in office or failure to act or failure to shoulder responsibility. Someone over here had a hand up. Yes. Yes, please. Nothing can demean the presidency. No, nothing can demean the office of the presidency. Nothing can demean it. He demeaned himself, but he didn't demean the office of the presidency. I think the Congress has, has in the last 10, maybe 15 years, has demeaned itself in not shouldering boldly and courageously its share of responsibility in governing. Do yes. <laughs> Dr. Allen in the second row had a has had his hand up for some time. I I didn't get that question, Dr. Allen. Comment on the harm done to Are you, uh, are you t talking about Vietnam War or what? The harm done to an American whale? No, the Oh, yes, well, uh, the harm done, no. Oh, you mean do I excuse it uh, abroad and, and uh, here at home it's inexcusable? Is that what you're asking? No, I think that, the, I, I, I don't see how, uh, 
uh, uh, as things are now, we will continue to have intelligence uh, 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 gathering agencies abroad. I say agencies, because I'm not sure it'll just be CIA. Uh, we'll be very lucky if they're put out of business here at home. I'm very lucky if, if some of the recommendations that have been proposed by the church committee are put through. We'll wait to see. But uh, that one of the recommendations was that they have an oversight committee in the House and the Senate, uh, uh, a committee that is aware of what funds the FBI gets here at home and how they are operating. And are they adhering to the regulations that will, the new regulations will be set up for them? And there are those powerful members of the Senate that are unutterably opposed to that. Yes. I don't see any any uh, any solution for the solu for the for for meeting uh, uh, the problem of, of of the ozone, the control of the seas, so that they they're not killed, uh, the the use of land, the use of of limited resources in the world except through international organizations. And I think we've reached a time now uh, uh, in the life on, of life on this globe when no one again, no government, no corporation, no individual can think of the, of the air and the water as something they can just despoil or use as they see fit. It's, a, it's, a, it's an international heritage for everyone. And there must be regulations. Uh, uh, we've discussed this in some of the classes here, but you know, uh, the ozone, you all know about the ozone? I won't tell you stuff that you know. You all know about it. Everyone knows about the ozone, right? Or do you? The photosynthesis of plants, which takes place, now we're told, by George Wald of Harvard, mostly on the upper level of the ocean, of the water of the oceans, put oxygen into the air. And when it put oxygen into the air, then something else happened. Way high in the atmosphere, a thin layer of air form called ozone. It's a composition. The aerosol sprays that we use are filling the atmosphere with the propellants of those sprays that contain gases with chlorine in them. And as they rise higher and higher in the atmosphere, the ozone that protects us from the short ray radiation of the sun that kills all of life, before the ozone formed, all of life existed under the water on this globe. It was only after the ozone formed that life began to emerge from the sea and the oceans and the rivers and so forth and come onto the land. As this propellant goes into the air, the short ray radiation decomposes the propellant, releases the chlorine. The chlorine then acts as a catalytic agent which sets up a chain reaction in the ozone. We've already lost 10%, says Dr. George Wall of Harvard, of the ozone. Now, certainly, that is an international question. That's not a question for the United States to solve, the Soviet Union to solve, or Great Britain to solve, or France to solve. We all must solve it. We're all going to fry if the ozone is lost, and it's a matter that is an immediate concern. And it's a matter certainly that students in a university uh, can become aware of, intelligent about it, can talk to neighbors about it, can spread the word about it in, in your state or you go back to other states and spread the word. Also spread the word that if the oceans die, you know Cousteau, you all follow Cousteau? You guys Cousteau? who spends most of his life on the water or under the water, you know, whose father developed the bathyscaphe, so forth. Well, uh, he's all the time warning us about the oceans because it also seems 
that photosynthesis, as I said before, doesn't take place on the land. It mostly takes place, some on the land, but mostly takes place in the topmost layer of the ocean and the, at Woods Hole Laboratory, where Dr. George Wall works summers. They discovered two years ago that the, the uh, thin bulk of oil on top of the seas and oceans of this earth, and they represent 70% of the earth, remember, constituted a greater bulk than the photosynthetic uh, synthesis uh, uh, on the enzymes. That again is an international question, isn't it? Now they've, they, we've had these, they're going to have here in your own university. You're going to have a meeting of the world food conference, which is wonderful. I mean, you can get educated there and what, what's happening about world food. One of the discoveries they've made now is, first of all, it was all laid at the door of the population explosion. Everything was based, the first estimates on that. Now they say, that is not altogether uh, uh, the cause of this shortage of grains around the world at the moment. It's due to the fact that the industrialized nations have suddenly are eating so much more beef and, and, uh, and uh, pork and takes 10 pounds of grain to develop one pound of meat. And that's the grain that, that could be used for starving people. Well, there's a new, I'm very heartened, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a pessimist, because I think we're living in a very creative time, very creative time. And if you get some of the scientific magazines and read them, and I recommend the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences, Chicago, right at the Chicago University, I'll tell you where, to, where, where you have to write to to get it there in Chicago. Uh, uh, there is a, a new uh, system of taking the waste of, of, of penned animals, and recycling that so that it produces protein and silence to feed to animals. And they figure out if all the animals of the globe were so, uh, if their waste was recycled, the millions and millions of, of, of pounds of, of protein and uh, uh, soybeans that would be saved for human beings. But there are all kinds of inventions that are going forward if we have the courage if we have the enthusiasm, if we have the understanding of what needs to be done. And we have to begin to put first things first. There's some things that won't wait. And that's about where we are. And I think certainly as students, I try to do it myself and I consider myself a student all the time. I'm studying all the time and I never feel I know anything or certainly not enough. Uh, uh, what you have to do, or you, you get a little fuddled, you know, is to be, have, a, have a general picture of where we are and what's happening, a general picture. And then, then decide what you're gonna be most interested in. But before you do that, have a set of priorities and just in the time it will take to check certain things. For instance, I don't see how ozone can wait. I don't see how the, the law of the sea, which is moment is being negotiated but hasn't been finally committed, and they also haven't, uh, haven't, uh, haven't ratified the nations, the law that is a little different one against the, the, the pollution of the seas by, by, by ships. Should be. There was a, I'm gonna tell you the story and then we're gonna go home. Uh, Cousteau told this. He talks about the bomb that's waiting to go off in the Mediterranean. I seem to be only talking about bombs tonight. It seems that a Yugoslav freighter left England with 600,000 pounds of, of, of uh, explosive cargo. And when it reached the mouth of the Adriatic, where it flows into the Mediterranean, it was rammed by a, a Panamanian uh, freighter. That was two years ago. It sank to the bottom of the sea two miles from Otranto on the coast of Italy. The crew was saved, 15 members, and they were saved. But it now is in the bottom of the sea, and it it's in these big metal tanks. And the big metal tanks are in the ship and on the, on the, the top uh, level of the ship, and it's rolling around. 
it is declared to be by the United Nations organizations entrusted with such responsibility, one of the most poison toxic uh, uh, chemicals that can be, uh, that, that has been manufactured by man. It is, see if I can remember, chloroethyl and chloromethyl lead. And it's used to put in gasoline so the gasoline won't have knocks in it, anti-knock, it's an anti-knock. Thing. And it's what poisons us when it comes out in the fumes of the gasoline. Well, that's in the bottom of the sea, and it's so poisonous that if a diver should dive to the bottom of the sea, and there should be a slight leak in one of these big tanks, and it got in his hands, it would cause convulsions, death. If one of these, these, these barrels rolled the two miles to the shore and a child played near it, the child would be dying, all kinds of horrible things happened to the child first. Uh, there has been bickering back and forth between the two nations, Yugoslavia and Panama, but nothing has happened. They haven't still decided up to this time what should be done. And as Cousteau said, to whom do we turn? To whom do we turn? You only can turn to some international organization where the rules and regulations set up, this can't happen, and if this happens, these people are responsible. And so I see no way that we can, we, can, we can abandon the United Nations. I think we've gone wrong when we turned our back on the United Nations in the Greek-Turkish matter, and that takes too long tonight to go into. But we did, we took matters into our own hands. I think that was a grievous error. But uh, uh, we have to work internationally. And of course there are difficulties. But who said life is gonna be easy at this point where we are? You know, we have to face what's here. And you have to be alive while you're living, and you have to work, and you have to try, and you have to inform yourself, and you have to have some joy in it. Because you can be dead, you know, very quickly. So you can't anticipate that all the time. You have to work with just what you have, and, and determine to make it better. That's all anybody can do, all anybody's ever been able to do down through life, is to make your contribution to the best you are able. Thank you very much, and good night. <laughs>